You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, we hear these commandments, but in our modern society, in our English-speaking world, do we really understand what this means? There are really three questions that need to be answered for us to understand what Jesus is commanding us to do, what God's law is telling us to do, the greatest commandments. First of all, what is love? Secondly, are all loves the same? Are they all equal? And third, how do we love practically when it's difficult to do so? So, first of all, what is love? Now, in the English language, we have some words that we use, multiple words for the same thing. For example, a lot of people have these little critters running around uh, in their farms that are sometimes called pigs, sometimes called hogs, sometimes called swine, sometimes after they're slaughtered called ham or bacon. We have a lot of words for that one animal, don't we? But we have one word for love. We say, I love God, I love my spouse, I love my children, I love my country, I love my friends, I love golf, I love puppies, I love chocolate ice cream. We use the exact same word, but do we mean it the same? I sure hope not. What is love? Back in the 80s, there was a pop singer named Tina Turner, and she had a very big song uh, which called, What Does Love Have to Do With It? And in one of the lines, she says, what is love but a secondhand emotion? And that's a pretty sorry way to look at love. What is love? Well, there's love that is the emotion of love, there's love that is the rational, willed love. And there is a love that comes from God. The emotion of love is the first emotion. It's not a secondhand emotion. It's the very first emotion. When we perceive something to be good or someone to be good, the first movement of the soul is to love that good. And then we desire to have that good and we experience joy if we obtain it. And if we don't obtain it, we experience sorrow and maybe anger. So take a three-year-old child. They're not fully rational yet. You show a child, they see an ice cream cone, they're moved to it, they want it. They see it as good, they desire it. And if you give them the ice cream cone, they're happy, they have joy. But if you deny them the ice cream cone, they're not happy, and then they're angry. So the first emotion, the first movement of us, though, is, is love toward the good. And this is a very important thing. But we are rational creatures. And so after we get to the age of reason, we have to let our reason enter into what we love. And we can choose between different loves. And we can choose whether... Uh, a love is appropriate or not. Uh, and we can um, love in different ways. So the second part of love or level of love, you might say, is rational, cho chosen love. And we, we perceive something to be good and then we will that good. In regard to another person, that means we will the good for the other person. Not what's good for me in regard to that person. It's not using another person. But it is seeing the good of the other, willing the good, choosing the good toward that other person. A lot of people think, oh, well, I, I love this or that. But they don't choose the good toward the other person. It's simply kind of a vague hope that the other person will have uh, something good. We have to make concrete choices. 
of how we can serve another person in love. That's what we do when we choose to love. Now, the third level, you might say, of love is divine love. It's when God puts his love into our hearts by his grace. And this is called the supernatural theological virtue of love. God gives us his love so that we can love him in return. God wants the good for us, wills the good for us, and then he puts that love into us so that we can love him back and so that we can love others not just with a human love, but with his divine love. We can share with them God's love. So, what is love? There's the emotion, there's chosen love, there's divine love that God puts into our soul with grace. Now, are all loves the same? If you walk around some neighborhoods, especially in big cities, you'll see all kinds of interesting yard signs. And some of them will say, uh, in this house we believe, and there's a whole list of very leftist things. But one of which says, love is love. All love is the same. Well, we've already seen there's emotional love, rational love divine love. So no, all love is not the same. But even within human love, not all love is the same. The love that a parent has for their child is not the same as the love that a child feels to the parent. The, child's, or the uh, child feels love because the parent gave them life. But parents feel love because that child has come forth from their love. And their whole life, as soon as they meet that child, they feel love, they experience love, they desire the good of their child, and they always will. Sometimes very difficult, especially like if a person has a child who becomes a, a ba real bad criminal. They're willing the good might be willing them to be locked up for their own good and for the good of society. But there is different love within family. The love that uh, siblings have is different than the love between parents and children. And this kind of familial love extends to the extended family, to the tribe, to the nation. But they're all within familial love, which the Greeks have an entirely different word for that love than they do for other types of love. Um, the love within family has differences within that. Then there is friendship love. And this friendship love, you can have man to man or woman to woman. And you can share deeply, very, very deeply with your friend. And you might, hopefully it's the point, the real friendship, that you would even die for your friend that you would lay down your life willingly to save your friend. We see this among soldiers, that oftentimes they willingly will die for their comrades, for their friends. Um, but you also can have friendship love between a man and a woman. But there has to be more reserve in that. Because if they shared everything in the same way they do with a friend of the same sex, it might have... Um, you know, some elements that could endanger chastity, for example, or propriety. Okay, so there are different loves and different types of love within the types. And then there is um, romantic love, what the Greeks called eros. I desire union with the other person. And people experience this in different ways. Some people experience this in same-sex attractions. Some people experience eros in uh, heterosexual relationships that don't have a commitment. And then there is eros properly directed in marriage. And to say that these are all the same would be absolutely false. Because in marriage, there is a total self-gift and a covenant love in which this, you disappear, if you will, into your spouse. You give yourself absolutely unselfishly to your spouse, and there is the potential that that love is so real that nine months later you have to name that little boy or girl. 
to say that love of heterosexual people who just choose to shack up or people in same-sex relationships is the same as that of marriage is not the case. It is not true. There isn't light. It's not directed to life. It's not directed to absolute selfless self-giving to the other person. There is an element of using another person. And that element of using could even creep into marriage. So there are different types of love. And to say, oh, all love is the same is absolutely false. Now, how do we love when it's not easy to love? How do we love in difficult situations? Well, we are called to will the good of another person. And because we have the grace of God with us, We've received baptism. Hopefully we're living in a state of sanctifying grace and we have that divine love, that divine charity within us. We will the good of the other person and we make choices to help the other person in practical ways. So an example, say you, somebody comes to you and it is a young woman and she is pregnant out of wedlock. Some people in the past scorned, looked down upon, shunned, and those are not love. Love is to say, to sit down with her, how can I help you? What can I do to help you to have this child? What can I do to help you to be successful as a mother? And so we can do that directly We can also do that through helping with a pregnancy resource center or helping with a home for unwed mothers. For example, in Bowling Green, they are currently preparing the St. Gianna home at Holy Spirit Church, which will do exactly that, will give a home for unwed mothers where they can be safe, they can be protected, They can gain the skills that they need so that they can be successful as mothers. So this is loving in practical, real ways. What about if somebody, we meet somebody and they are hurting from an abortion? You may not know this, but more and more studies are showing that about 70% of women who have abortion felt pressure or coercion, or were even forced. Pressure is a certain amount, you know, given emotional pressure. Coercion, their arms being twisted. Forced, they're actually sometimes being held down against their will. But 70% of women who've had abortions have that kind of thing in their background. They have pain. They have grief. And even if they didn't, even if they freely chose an abortion, There's still a trauma, there's a hurt. So what do we do? Well, if you meet them in a a crowd, say you happen to be at a a rally and there's a hundred people shouting and screaming their abortion, you probably aren't going to be able to reach them in a good way at that point. But if you can sit down one-on-one with someone, if you can listen to that person, and let them, that person, that woman, or that man, many men hurt from abortion as well, open their heart, share their heart, share their story, share their pain. And if you can cry with them, if you can, if it's appropriate, give them a hug. If you can be with them and you can maybe lead them to something that brings them to healing like Rachel's Vineyard, then that is loving in practice. Another case is a lot of young people today are being um, propagandized into gender identity crisis, thinking that they're transgender, thinking they're something other than what they were created. And many of these young people are hurting. They are in pain. And it's because, precisely because they're in pain that they're vulnerable to the lies being forced upon them by adults who don't have their true good in mind. So listening, actually being there for somebody, um, actually helping a young person who is struggling to know that if we weather it through, and I will be there for you, I will be there with you, if we weather it through, 90-some percent of young people who weather through and don't 
try to change from male to female or female to male, they will come out on the other side as a young adult and they will be happy with who they are. They will be at peace with how God made them. And so we accompany them by being there for them in practical ways, listening and, you know, being a friend, really being a friend, really showing care for them. We can help young people through that type of a crisis. I was recently giving a mission out in Oregon, and in the parish there, a number of people go out to work with the homeless. And I don't know about you, but I always struggle. What do I do when I encounter a homeless person? Because homelessness is not just, everybody's not the same. Some people are homeless because of mental illness. Some people are homeless because of addictions. Some people are homeless because they're veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress or from traumatic brain injury. Some people are homeless, frankly, because they've chosen to be homeless. We see more and more of that among young people. They're choosing it as a lifestyle. And how we interact with them, how we help them, will vary according to each person, where they're at. A person who's struggling with mental health will need to be helped to get the appropriate professional help. A person who is struggling with trauma is going to need help in that direction. A person who has an addiction is going to need somebody who says, no, I will not give you any money or anything you can convert to money. But when you want to really get out of this, I will help you get into a facility to help you to get out of this drug addiction, out of this lifestyle. And those who are just choosing to be homeless, who think that's a kind of cool way to live, you might have to say, hey, no, it's not. I'm not giving you anything. I'm not facilitating this kind of lifestyle choice. But the main thing that the people going out, have, I've learned, is treat people as a human being. So many people who are homeless in the cities are hurt by the fact that people walk by as if they don't exist. People don't even look at them, don't address them, don't say hello to them. You know, just to say hello, to look somebody in the eye, or to say, can I get you a sandwich? Or can I do something? Do you need a blanket in the winter? Something. Can I help you get to a shelter? Something practical that it respects them as a human being. That is the main thing practical. We've got to be real about love. And when people say, well, I've got this kind of fuzzy feeling in my heart toward the homeless or toward somebody who's struggling uh, with gender identity, that's not love. We've got to make practical choices to actually will the good, to bring the good to that person. And the ultimate good for each person is to bring them to know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to share the gospel, the faith that he has given to us in our Catholic faith, to bring them ultimately with us to eternal life. That has to be our goal. And if each of us seeks to bring other people with us, I was just reading something in Bishop Sheen. If one person madly in love with Jesus decides that every year they're going to bring another person to know Jesus. That one person over the course of 30 years will help a billion people come to know Jesus Christ and his love. My brothers and sisters, that is our call, to love in actuality, to be real about love and to bring people to know his peace, his joy, his healing, and ultimately eternal life. God love you.